was no uh, noise, um, electrical noise, uh, that would interfere with any, any true readings that I might have. So I, um, I was in there, and I had the tape recorder going, and I was sound intoning the sound of the, of the chamber, uh, you know, the distinct 440 frequency. Oh, oh, it's great, you know, I was really getting into it. But, the, um, but anyway, the lights weren't going off. And so finally, I just stomped across the floor, you know, climbed through the passageway, yelled down to the guards, turn off the lights, you know, <laughs> and then came back into the chamber. And fortunately, I got back just in time uh, because they turned the lights off and there was my flashlight. And then I was able to conduct my tests. Um, one problem I had, though, was that while the lights went off, the fans didn't. They were in a, on a separate circuit, and the fans kept on running, so uh, I was thwarted in that respect. Uh, hopefully, this year, um, we can uh, get some purer, purer readings. But back in my room later, I had the tape recorder running, and um, I also had the chromatic tuner, and the tape recorder was, had recorded all my chanting. It had recorded every step that I took across the floor. It recorded my yelling down the grand gallery to turn off the lights. And by the way, uh, the separation, I mean, my tape recorder was over here and I was out here. And when I yelled down to turn off the lights, it was almost like I was right next to the tape recorder. It wasn't like I was, there was a separation of t uh, thousands of tons of granite and limestone between me and the tape recorder. And there's a reason for that. <clears throat> the, uh, but the other part of it was that every step I took across the floor, um, as it was played back, the tuner recorded 440. So it's not just the intoning of the, of the frequency, but even striking the floor with a footstep caused the chamber to ring 440, which is brilliant. It's great. The other part, the other part that was really neat was that when you're in the chamber and you are intoning that 440, str very strong tone, um, you don't hear what else is going on. There's other things going on. And the tape recorder actually picked that up. And it was higher frequencies where the power, or the energy, was cascading to higher frequencies within the chamber as, as I was intoning. And that was played back on the, uh, on the tape recorder. <clears throat> so really we're talking about these master engineers, scientists, uh, acoustic engineers. And nothing they did, they did by chance. Everything was intentional. And so then I began to think about these granite beams above. And I came to the conclusion that those granite beams, they had to have actually tuned them to respond to a particular frequency. And really, just like piano strings, if you have strike one and you undampen the strings, another one at a higher octave will, will resonate. The harmonic of that particular frequency will resonate. It will absorb the energy and respond in sympathy with it. And you can actually transfer energy from this lowest beam clear to the top beam. If each of those beams is tuned to the same frequency or a harmonic of that frequency, and that is what I believe is, hap is happening. The other part was that when, uh, when Howard Weiss's men went into this opening right here, they found that the, the whole floor of the, or the top of the beams was covered with this fine black powder. And the fine black powder, they uh, examined it and they determined it to be exuviae or the cast off shells and skins of insects. And that was a puzzle to me, too. Why, what was the purpose for that? And then it all comes back down to the energy, energy inside that chamber. And the 
ultimate conclusion that there had to have been an explosion within the chamber that forced the walls out, caused the beams to rise, crash back down, and the energy level was so high that the core masonry and the limestone vibrated, the air was filled with this dust, and actually the elements of the limestone, which are made up of this pneumolytic limestone, uh, which is actually seashells and uh, foraminifers, uh, <clears throat> that they may have been, may have filled the air, may have actually been scorched and blackened and then finally deposited on the top of the beams. That's just a possibility. Um, so that's the summary of the Giza power plant, really. That what we have is a source of energy, which is the earth, coming through the Great Pyramid. We have the hydrogen generation here. Uh, we have energy collected here. We have resonator hall that collects the energy. That energy is directed into this chamber. The energy of that chamber is raised to a much higher level. It affects the hydrogen in that chamber. The hydrogen uh, moves, is pumped, to a higher, higher energy state. And then what we have is an input signal coming in. Oops, wrong one. An input signal coming in, collected from the universe. That's the source of your signal. Coming in through this shaft into the chamber. And then something happens there. And I, I, uh, I made an analogy when we were on the... Uh, on the cruise with the uh, body, mind, spirit journey, we we did a uh, what they call the the conga. And I asked the group in my presentation, you know, do you know what stimulated emission is? You know, and everybody's going, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's it's not a it's not a sexual thing, you know, unless you want it to be. But the uh, but. But a stimulated emission is a term that is used in a maser or laser. So you have microwave amplification through stimulated emission radiation. That's the acronym. Uh, laser is light amplification through stimulated emission radiation. And then the stimulated emission part is where you have a photon which is emitted after an electron is forced down to its ground state, it releases a little packet of energy. That little packet of energy uh, moves in a particular direction. Uh, and it can be entrained with other little packets of energy. And, and I, I, I crafted the uh, analogy of the, the conga because basically what you have is a room full of little atoms and they're all building up this energy because of all this belly dancing that's going on and the music and everybody's getting pumped up and then and then they say come with me come with me and they all fall, follow a line and they all just start dancing around the room you know and eventually one joins and another one joins in another one joins in until everybody's releasing all their energy and they go back to their chairs and start to top up again but anyway the uh, <coughs> but anyway the that, that, that is actually <laughs> a very loose analogy, but it, it really could work that way because the, the photon in a laser or a maser um, strikes a, a electron that's at a higher, a higher state and, and drives it down to a lower state and then that packet of energy that's released is entrained with the direction of the input signal. And it happens billions or trillions of times a second. And it happens so fast uh, that over the, le the width of this chamber, you could have a tremendous buildup of energy. Uh, a lot of energy could be entrained with that, with that input signal and then collected uh, from this chamber and then coming up to the outside. So. The F-sharp chord is evident in the King's Chamber. And that is actually, uh, it was detected by Tom Danley. I think I said 95, but it was 96, I believe, when he did that. Um, and it was detected by him. 
without any external stimulus uh, that he knew of. Uh, he had all his equipment turned off. There was nobody else in the pyramid. Uh, but the F-sharp chord was detected not in an audible, for an audible frequencies, but in uh, infrasonic between 2 and 9 hertz. The other interesting thing is, is that the, um, <clears throat> when I wrote my book, I, we talked about the, the Earth's hum. I, I, I discussed that a little bit in my book. And they, it hadn't really, it was just a theoretical uh, discussion because it hadn't really detected the, the Earth's hum. And um, in 1998, before, actually it was published in 98, the same time as my book, two Japanese scientists published a paper that they had uh, actually detected the Earth's hum, and the frequencies were between 2 and 7 hertz. And, and so basically what we have is a device that's so finely tuned to the planet uh, that it's, it's selectively picking out frequencies from the Earth and, and, and drawing them through. The, uh, I, I speculated that, they, that these were actually Helmholtz resonators. Um, my thinking on that has changed a little bit because the Helmholtz resonator is the, the, the king's chamber, and that is actually the, the Helmholtz resonator. These were resonators to be sure, but they were not Helmholtz in that they did not hold the energy, uh, build the energy up inside them. They converted the vibration into airborne sound, and then that was directed through the, uh, into the king's chamber. Oh, there's me. Oh, there's me again. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that is Dr. Hawass, my new best friend. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I met him in 2001, and uh, with uh, Gail Fallon, who was the producer of Pax Television, or Grizzly Adams, and uh, and so uh, I used that in, entree to get into the set of PM, and uh, it was a very fruitful experience, really. Um, Stephen earlier showed the Grand Gallery, and we're looking now at um, the, some of the staining on the, uh, I believe this is the, this is the northern face of the Grand Gallery. But along the ceiling, in uh, 1999 when we were there, and, and I think that's, I don't know whether that was when Stephen took his photographs, but they, they had, uh, they closed the pyramid for cleaning, and of course, you know, the speculation was, the scuttlebutt on the internet was that uh, the Hawass was really digging a tunnel over to the uh, southern shaft, Ganton Brink's door, and <clears throat> uh, he wasn't really cleaning. Well, they had cleaned it. It was obvious that they had cleaned it. But uh, here we had these, these scorch marks uh, so deep in, into, the, into the limestone that they couldn't clean them out. And you can really see that the, the thermal stress in the in the limestone. And referring back to what Stephen was saying earlier, when when we were there with with Ted, Robin Mitchell, and Ivy West in uh, 1999, uh, they flooded the the wall of the Grand Gallery with uh, light, and you saw the damage on the walls, and it was uh, at each corbeling on the walls, and following the line right down, it went right down into a slot. So that to me was basically evidence that came in after the fact, after the theory had been proposed, and uh, actually it supported the, the hypothesis. And, it, and, it, and really, if the hypothesis had been challenged, uh, that question could have been, could have been uh, posed, you know, that, okay, well, if your theory is correct, then these conditions should exist in the Grand Gallery. Uh, th those questions weren't really posed to me, but the, you know, the evidence is definitely there. And as you can see, these two ceiling beams right here, is, that's, that's not the limestone that you find in the lower parts of the Grand Gallery. Canton Brink's door. Um, it was discovered in 1993, Upawat II, uh, went, uh, went up this, the southern shaft and found this blockage. I was with a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Summers, at the time when we saw that documentary, and he commented, "Well, they look like electrodes." And of course, you know, why, did, why didn't I say that first? Because 
Um, that 